O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. Our service tonight begins on page five of the cream-colored booklet. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, A very warm welcome to Choral Evensong this evening on the second Sunday before Lent. Welcome to those of you who are here in the chapel and to those who are joining us on the live stream. The psalm set for tonight is Psalm 43, the words of which can be found on the inside of the white notice sheet.
The first lesson is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the sea, great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Here ends the first lesson. We stand to sing hymn number 385.
Our second lesson this evening is taken from Matthew chapter 6, beginning at the 25th verse. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body, more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
one or two brief notices before tonight's anthem. After the service, uh, those who wish to are very welcome to come and join us for supper. Uh, we'll be carrying on for the moment doing what we did last week, which was uh, going through the cafeteria, getting our uh, food through the till in the normal way, and then taking it through to the Harrison room uh, above the bar uh, where we can enjoy each other's company. Um, that's unless we're directed otherwise by the catering staff, but uh, that's what I think is going to happen. So do stay and join us if you'd like to do that. This week's uh, services follow the normal pattern, morning prayer at 8.30 each morning, choral evensong on Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 in the evening. This morning uh, at Holy Communion, uh, we were very glad to be joined by a, a new group of singers to help enhance our worship. And if you'd like to join us for Holy Communion next Sunday at 10.30 in the morning, we hope to see you there. In the evening at Choral Evensong at 6, our preacher next week will be uh, the Reverend Joshua Brocklesby. Josh was a, an ordinand on attachment uh, when he was uh, here as a student. And um, we look forward very much to welcoming him back. He's now assistant curate at St. Mary's Watford. And tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome back the Reverend Michael Johns Perring. Michael, a bit before Josh, uh, was uh, also a student on attachment here in the chapel uh, whilst at Westcott House, uh, and is now uh, assistant curate at St. Andrew and St. Mark's Surbiton, uh, where this is his third year. It's a place close to my heart, as I was once a server there. Um, very good to have you back with us, Michael, after a few years' absence, and we look forward very much to hearing your sermon tonight. First, the choir sing tonight's anthem, James Macmillan's setting of Psalm 96. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song.
May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Worry. What is it good for? Well, a little worry we might think of as useful. It can keep us on our toes. It helps us to be attentive. But too much worry can be self-defeating. As you will discover this evening, I am something of a natural-born warrior. And I come from a line of natural-born warriors. My mother, I think she's watching this evening, is a natural-born warrior. So much so, in fact, that uh, I had to tell her of my safe arrival in Cambridge after my journey from Surbiton. Michael Gove once said famously or infamously that we've had enough of experts. And there are days when I think he's onto something in a roundabout kind of a way. I realize um, this is perhaps a rather risky opening gambit to make in a place so full of experts. But please bear with me. In so many areas of our lives, there are plenty of people who are both more than willing and more than able to give us advice. And most, I should add, are well-meaning and have a great deal of wisdom to offer. There is a reason they are looked up to as experts. And I suppose we should be grateful that we have so many looking out for our best interests. The problem is that being able to hear from all of them all of the time on every aspect of our lives can be a smidge overwhelming and a little bit worrying. There are people who can teach us how to find the perfect partner and how to keep them, how to have children and how to raise them to become model citizens, how to get our dream job and get promotion after promotion until we reach the top of our field, and how to get the perfect balance to go with that dream work life and that dream home life. There are people who can teach us what exercise we should be getting and how regularly, how much sleep we should be getting, what sort of food we should be eating, how we should be living ethically, how we, and I realize this isn't a concern yet for, for many here, how we could be saving to buy a house. What sort of house should we be buying? You can tell I've been in the suburbs a little bit now in my ministry. How we should decorate and furnish said house. How should we be investing our money and saving for our retirement? And then if we have pets, there are people to tell us how we should look after them. And if all of that leaves us feeling a bit worried and feeling that we are never quite good enough, there are people who can teach us how to be less worried. And of course, not everyone agrees about the right way of doing things. And there are several opinions to be consulted. I remember the first time I was at university and I was introduced to all those books that tell you about how to write an effective essay and how to prepare for exam success. And I remember thinking, great, not only do I have to learn my subject, but I have to learn how to learn how to learn my subject. Now, there are more things for me to forget, even more for me to worry about. In every aspect of our lives, there is so much information out there designed to help us. It can feel as though we are obligated to become experts in every area of our lives just to exist, as though being a polymath is the baseline. And because that's not possible for most of us, we find ourselves doing what we have always done. We sort of muddle through the best we can. But that seems unsatisfactory somehow. And we worry because we think we should be doing better than just muddling through. After all, we're the latest generation of the most highly evolved species we know about. As we heard in our first lesson, God saved us until the last day 
of creation before he took a rest. God saved us until last. We are made in his image. I mean, we should have it all nailed by now, surely. Especially with all the information we have at our fingertips. And the truth is, it can be very easy to feel inadequate most of the time about almost every area of our lives. Even before we, uh, anything should go awry. Even before we face a pandemic. In everything we do, we can feel under immense pressure to be doing things the right way. And we can feel like failures when things do go wrong. And this can be a cause of great worry. And this worry can affect our time, energy, and attention. Like when we worry about the fact we might not be doing the right amount of work while we are resting. But then we worry we are not getting the right amount of rest when we are working. There's probably a, a, a book or two about getting that right. As a husband, father, with a small f and a big f, dog owner, landlord registered in Scotland, pescatarian with kidney disease and a garden, just to get by I feel I should have all the skills and that knowledge of a relationship counsellor, child psychologist, pediatrician, theologian, liturgist, negotiator, social worker, animal psychologist, property lawyer conversant in Scots law, nutritionist, dietitian, nephrologist, and horticulturalist. Now, some of these areas I, are be I am better at than others, but in most areas I will at times feel varying degrees of imposter syndrome, and in a few of them I feel I have a complete lack of competence. Now, I suspect you haven't come here this evening to hear about a relatively privileged white man go on about his early midlife crisis. So what does Jesus have to say on the matter of worrying? As we heard this evening in our second lesson, Jesus tells us not to worry. After all, he says, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And he's got a point. What does worrying add to anything? In other words, we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. We can only do what we can do. Worrying won't help us. We can't know everything. We are only limited beings. We are not God. But when Jesus tells us not to worry, he's not speaking about the first world worries I have been just prattling on about, but more fundamental worries that sadly too many of our brothers and sisters still grapple with in this country and around the world today, like the worry to have enough to eat and drink, and the worry to have adequate clothing. And while do not worry about your life may seem insensitive advice to those who find themselves struggling to survive, it is nevertheless true that no one should worry ultimately, because God will provide just as he provides for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Nothing can separate us from God's love. And if we are not to worry, should we be faced with these more existential threats, and those threats have been a little closer to home these past couple of years or so, how much less should we be worried about other things, like the pursuit of perfection in all aspects of our lives? Because the truth is we will never reach that however hard we try. And like King Solomon's clothes, when compared to the beauty of nature, we will not better God or his handiwork. We can still, of course, be the best that we can be. And some of you here are on the road to becoming experts in a particular field. Others of you are experts already. And we do need experts in all kinds of areas, because we can't be experts at everything. In many places, the Bible speaks of the greatness of wisdom, the true pinnacle of God's creation, not us. And there is a beauty in the fact that all the world's knowledge cannot be retained by one person, but must be shared between us. It doesn't matter that I'm not a horticulturalist, 
I only grow sunflowers and runner beans. It doesn't matter that I'm not a nephrologist because I can see one when I need to. Rather than focus on what we are not or what we can't do or can't do well, let us focus on the things we can do. There will be days when we feel out of our depth, not just in our chosen field, but in many areas of our life. There will be times when it feels like nothing is going right and we find ourselves lacking. But do not worry. God will see you right in the end. Don't put extra pressure on yourselves. Worrying won't help matters. For some things there are indeed experts we can turn to, should we need them. But for everything else, put your trust in the Lord. Finally, and again I suspect none of you came here this evening for a half-baked graduation speech, but I would like to end with a specific piece of practical advice. And this comes from bitter, lived experience. It's not my intention to worry any of you unduly. In fact, I'd rather you not worry at all. But for those of you who are sitting exams, when you get your exam timetable, double check, no triple check, what time your exams start. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we hold before you the communities to which we belong this evening. We pray especially for your blessing on all that live, work and study at our colleges of Newnham and Selwyn. We hold before you all those who are particularly in need of our prayers praying for those in our communities who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. We hold before you all those who have COVID and are in isolation, praying especially that you would bring swift recovery to Her Majesty the Queen. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord our God, order the course of this world in peace that your church may joyfully serve you in all goodness. We pray for this place of worship and for all those that are meaningful to us. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you might use these places for the furtherance of your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you are the fountain of all peace, spiritual and temporal. We thank you that you hold all of our burdens and all of our worries. We humbly pray in your great goodness that you would guide the leaders of the nations towards all that makes for peace. Keep all people safe from war and conflict and fill the whole earth with the peace that comes from your spirit through your dear Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, the resurrection and the life of them that believe, who didst enrich thy servant George Augustus Selwyn with the manifold gifts of grace, grant that all who serve thee here may be taught by his example to serve in their several callings to the honour of thy name, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. We say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 408.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance on you and grant you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>